Hello everyone, welcome to Providian Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about the Bernoulli and the binomial distribution, and we're going to use the binomial distribution to analyze the empirical probability estimator. This is the first time that we're going to use a tool from probability theory to study a statistical technique. Let's get to it. We're going to talk about the binomial distribution. The plan is to derive the Bernoulli and the binomial distributions and then use the binomial distribution to analyze the, pro the empirical probability estimator. The Bernoulli distribution is super simple. Imagine that you flip a coin that is heads with probability theta and that you define a random variable that is equal to one if the coin, if the coin flip is heads and to zero if the coin flip is tails. That's a Bernoulli random variable. Let's think of the PMF of a Bernoulli random variable, which we denote like this because it depends on theta. But we could also just say that the random variable is equal to, is, is, is denoted by A with this squiggly line because it's a random variable. And that this is its PMF, probability mass function, just to connect to the notation of other videos. So here we're just kind of making explicit that this particular PMF depends on theta, but it is the PMF, the probability mass function of a random variable. Anyways, what is that probability mass function equal to at one? The probability that the coin flip is heads, so theta. What is it at zero? The probability that the coin flip um, is tails, one minus theta. And we see that this is a valid PMF because it's non-negative and it, uh, it adds up to one. And that's it. It's as simple as that. This is probably the simplest possible uh, random variable that you could think of. Now, let's talk about the binomial random variable. To motivate it, imagine that you flip that coin that we just talked about n times independently. Each coin flip is equal to heads with probability theta and all the flips are independent. What is the probability of observing heads? Our strategy is going to be, is going to, be to decompose that event that we're interested in into a union of other events. So we want to see um, what the probability is of observing a heads and n minus a tails, in how many ways can this happen? Well, you could see first a heads and then n minus a tails. Or you could see first heads, then tails, then the rest of the heads, then the rest of the tails, and so on and so forth. You basically have to take into account all the possible orderings between the a heads and the n minus a tails. Now, let me ask you, are these events disjoint? The answer is yes, because this, for example, in this cannot happen at the same time because that would imply that the second coin flip is heads and tails at the same time. So these sequences, these different orderings cannot happen simultaneously, which means that the events are disjoint, which is very important because now we want to compute the probability of a heads. We can express it as the sum of the probabilities of these individual events. What are the probabilities of those individual events. Let's take a look. We will focus on the case first where we just have a heads and then n minus a tails. And we will imp and we're, here is where we're going to impose our assumption that the flips are independent. If the flips are independent, all of these events are mutually independent, which means that the probability of their intersection can be expressed as the product of the individual probabilities. And now these individual probabilities are easy. These guys, probability of heads are all theta. These guys, probability of tails are one minus theta. How many thetas do we have? A, right, because they're A heads. How many one minus thetas do we have? N minus A, because that's the number of tails. And that's what that probability is equal to. Now imagine that you had a slightly different ordering. For example, this one where you see heads, tails, and then the rest. Is the probability going to be the same? The answer is yes, right? Because when you, you're going to take the same step here and what's going to happen is that you're going to obtain exactly the same probabilities, but in a different order, but you're multiplying them together anyways. And because multiplication is commutative, you get the same result. So you're going to end up with the same probability for this ordering and any of the other orderings that have exactly a heads and n minus a tails. So all of the, those events have the same probability. Now we just need to figure out how many of them there are. In how many ways can we order A heads into N slots? Well, the 
This is given by the binomial coefficient. In case you're not familiar with binomial coefficients or you haven't seen them in a while, the idea is that imagine that you're considering, for example, five slots and two ones. Okay, so we want to know how, how we can scramble these ones and zeros, like how many different scramblings there are. Scrambling, super technical term. So if we just um, cared about ordering the different positions, like we treat this like one, two, three, four, five, then this would be just the permutations, right? This is the possible number of permutations that we have. But some of these permutations are gonna give you the same result. For example, if you swap here one and two, there are both ones, right? So for that, that, for us, that's the same result. So we have to divide by the possible permutations within the ones. We have to divide by a two factor. Now we also need to do the same thing for the zeros because permuting the zeros doesn't change anything for us. So we also divide by three factorial and that's exactly where the binomial coefficient comes from. This was just like a super quick review to give you a little bit of intuition, but you know, go look at the, the Wikipedia page for the binomial coefficient or for permutations if, you're, if you don't remember this stuff very well. The point is that this is the number of different orderings that there are. So now we have the probability of the event that we're interested in. It's the number of orderings times the probability of each ordering, and they're all the same as we showed. So this is the probability of seeing A heads. So now we go back to um, the way we have modeled this. We, had, we were wondering what's the probability of seeing A heads. Now you can say, okay, I can, I can represent the number of heads that I see by a random variable that can be equal to zero, one, up to n. And since I have the probabilities of each of those, which are equal to that, I have basically derived the probability mass function of this random variable. And that's um, um, a random variable that has this probability mass function is called a binomial random variable. I like to think about it in terms of coin flips, but there's many different situations that you can model in this way. For example, um, you're, you know, shooting, you're shooting a basketball, uh, you shoot 10 times, how many of them go in? You could model this like a binomial random variable as long as each shot has the same probability of going in and uh, you consider the shots independent. And then there's many, many other examples. We're going to use it, in fact, to model the empirical probability estimator. But before that, we need to stress the fact that this is a parametric distribution that depends on two parameters, n and theta. n is usually obvious from the modeling, and theta is like the key parameter here that completely determines the shape. So remember, theta is the probability of being heads, of the probability of that each individual coin flip is equal to heads. Here we're seeing the number of coin flips and their probability. So here the probability is very concentrated in a small number of coin flips, which is normal, we have 20 coin flips by the way, because um, the probability of each individual coin flip is 0.2. If we increase the probability that each individual coin flip is heads, so we increase theta, we're gonna see the probability moving towards the right because higher number of uh, heads are more likely. And even more so if we increase theta to 0.8. All right, so again, the shape of the, the probability mass function is completely determined by theta. Okay, so now let's use the binomial distribution to study the empirical probability estimator. So just to be very clear, the empirical probability estimator in principle has nothing to do with binomial distributions. It's just an estimator for the probability of an event. Okay, so we have an event A in a certain sample space and now we need to estimate it from data. We need to estimate the probability of that event happening from data. So we gather some data that take values in the sample space. We want to estimate the probability of A. What do we do? We look at the fraction of data points that end up in A. That's a very simple estimator, but very powerful. It's called the empirical probability estimator. Just, uh, you know, in terms of notation, this is uh, an indicator function that is equal to one if that data point is in A and to zero otherwise. All right, and we use this all over the place to estimate probabilities in practice. Now we're going to use the binomial distribution to analyze the behavior of this estimator. Why do we want to analyze the behavior of this estimator? Because we already saw that when we have limited data, the estimator can actually be quite noisy. 
So for example, here, we're going to take a look at, um, at coin flips from a fair coin. So the true probability that we're trying to estimate is 0 0.5, but we only get to see 20 data points. And we're going to look at the fraction of them that are heads, and that's going to be our estimate for this uh, 0 0.5 probability that we want to estimate. Our estimate for what we want to estimate. Wonderful. Okay, so we do this 10 times, and um, these are the, the number of heads that we observe, and these are the estimates for the probability. And what we can see is that they're kind of, you know, not so far from 0 0.5, but sometimes they can be kind of far. So our goal is to understand how likely we are to be uh, accurate, um, to, to get an, an accurate estimate of this probability when we're using the empirical probability estimator. And for that, we're going to model the data probabilistically. So we're going to assume that each data point is in A with probability theta true, which is the same for all data points. Okay, that's a reasonable assumption. If we're estimating a probability, hopefully the probability that each data point belongs to the event is equal to that probability. Now we're going to define these events bi that uh, essentially tell us whether the ith data point belong to A or not. And we're going to impose that the data points are independent. This is the mathematical way of writing it, but the point is that um, data point one is in A, that, that event is independent from data point two is in A or data point two is not in A. Okay, it's independent from both of those events. And in general, from the ith uh, event being in A or not, what's more, all of these events are mutually independent. So all the data are mutually independent. If you build a sequence of n events where in each of them you write either bi, so the data point is in A or bi complement, the ith data point is not in A, those sequences are all mutually independent. This is just to say that uh, the data points are independent. They belong to A or not independently. I said independent like maybe a hundred times in this explanation, but it is kind of important. Okay, so now we're going to model the number of data that end up in A under these assumptions by a random variable C. Okay, so now let's think what the distribution of C is. So C is the number of data points that end up in A. The probability that for each of them is theta and they're all independent. So what, what, what random variable is that? This is exactly a binomial with parameter n equal to the number of data and theta true is the parameter, right? So you can think of uh, uh, the event, the data point i belongs to A as coin flip i is equal to heads exactly the same thing. So we could go through the same argument that we went before and we would end up with the same probability mass function for this random variable. Okay, so what's the distribution of C? It's binomial with parameters n and theta true, so it has this probability mass function. But we're not really interested in the count, right, in how many data points end up in A. We're interested in the empirical probability. The empirical probability is equal to c divided by n. This is a deterministic function of the count, right? So what is the, the PMF of this new random variable? Realize that we have put a squiggly line on top of theta because this is a random variable now, okay? And there are assumptions. This models the number, the, the empirical probability that we're going to observe. Uh, we're treating it as an uncertain quantity in order to study its behavior, okay? That's, this is the whole point. And now we want the PMF of that quantity that is, is going to tell us how the empirical probabilities are going to behave. So we want the PMF of theta tilde. What do we have? We have the, probability, the PMF of C. So we better express theta tilde in terms of C. If theta tilde is equal to T, then C is going to be equal to N times T, right? Because theta is equal to C over N. Right? So this event is exactly equivalent to this. And now this probability we know. We can just plug in the binomial PMF uh, because we know that C is binomial. So this is the probability that the empirical probability is equal to T. And now we can just plot this for different values of N 
Um, and here we're going to fix theta true to be one half, just to make things simple. Now we're going to ask ourselves when we vary n, what is the behavior of the empirical probability? Hopefully, think it's good to think in these kind of situations, what do you expect? But we, we want to have a good estimate of theta true. So we hope that this PMF is going to concentrate close to theta true. And we expect that when we have more data points, that's going to happen. Okay, and um, again, the idea is that we have, imagine, we can imagine this in terms of coin flips. Imagine that you flip a coin 20 times or 100 times or 1000 times, you would expect these estimates of the empirical probability to become closer and closer to 0 0.5. Again, each coin flip is, has this true probability that is 0 0.5. Let's see if our uh, probabilistic analysis uh, is consistent with that. So this is the PMF of the empirical probability for uh, theta true, I should have said, equal to 0 0.5, and now different values of n, 20, 40, and 80. And what we see is that for 20, the PMF is quite spread out, and it becomes more and more concentrated around the true value 0 0.5 as we increase n. So it's exactly what we um, expected, and we can even compute probabilities. So for example, we can compute the probability that where our error is 0 0.1 or less. So we flip 20 coins, what's the probability that our empirical probability is uh, at a distance of 0 0.1 from 0 0.5. So basically we're between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. What is that probability? We can compute it exactly. And that probability is 0 0.737. So three quarters of the time, our error is below 0 0.1. If we increase the number of data, we flip uh, 40 coins instead, that probably becomes, probability becomes 0 0.846. And by the way, how are we computing that probability? We're going back and using the PMF of the, um, of our empirical probability estimator, right? You add that PMF over the relevant values. Okay, so we see that from 20 to 40, this increases, and if we increase to 80, it increases even more. You're almost at 95% of the time, you're between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. If you increase this further, you would see that this collapses closer and closer and closer to 0 0.5. And spoiler alert, uh, that's essentially the, the law of large numbers, but we'll talk about this uh, in a while. All right, so what have we learned? We have learned the definition of the Bernoulli and the binomial distributions, and we have used the binomial distribution to study the empirical probability estimator, which uh, gives us an example of how we can use tools from probability theory to understand how a statistical technique is going to perform under certain assumptions when we vary, for example, the number of data that are available. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.